Welcome to our webinar today, Creating a Successful Digital First Company, Aligning People, Processes, and Technology. We're so grateful that you are taking the time today to join us. And uh, I'd like to take a moment and introduce you to our guest today, Barton Goldenberg. Uh, Barton is the founder and president of ISM Inc. and also the author of many books, including The Definitive Guide to Social CRM. And also an interesting fun fact is one of the first three executives uh, honored in the CRM Hall of Fame. So we're certainly uh, grateful to have him join us today and share his wisdom on this wonderful topic. Quick introduction from myself. I'm Andy Zambito. I'm the Chief Sales Officer of Americas at Creatio, and I'll be your host for today's session. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone during the session to insert questions into our chat field. Uh, during the course of the session, we will also offer up uh, a few polls uh, that we really encourage your uh, engagement with. And we'll share those results with you, of course, as we go through the session. And let's keep this as interactive as, as possible. Uh, Barnes agreed to potentially answer questions during the presentation as we go live to try to answer what we can in real time. So thank you for that. Before we dive into the topic, I did want to just share a, a brief word about Creatio for those in our audience who aren't fully familiar with us and, and uh, how we approach this space. And I always like to start with Creatio's vision here. We, we welcome to the world a, 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 an environment where everyone, and we mean everyone, business users and IT as well, can automate their ideas in minutes. And to do so, we have, we have delivered one of the world's leading platforms that, as you see on the bottom, low-code, no-code platform focused on business process management. And on top of that, we're ready, able to deliver ready-to-use business applications. And CRM, of course, is at the core of this, and we're a leader in that space. But we want you to think beyond that as well. Business apps, vertical apps for your industry, add-ons and templates from our partners in the marketplace and our users who create them for you. And this is really an ecosystem that allows for rapid deployment of your business ideas into your enterprise. To that end, we've been recognized and we're quite proud of this by Gardner across five different quadrants. We're a leader in several of these, including the CRM topics that we'll be talking about today. Equally important is not just Gardner, but Forrester, but, but for us, what matters most is the user engagement. As anyone uh, has, who's ever done a deployment of large business applications knows, it's really the engagement and the usability by your audience that makes the difference. And this is where we exceed all industry metrics and have done quite well. And so we're really proud of that. And for our customers who are joining this uh, webinar today, thank you so much for your participation. So with that, I'm about to turn this over to Barton to please kick us off and uh, lead us through today's session. And I'll be moderating the questions as we go. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, Barton, for you. Thank you very much, Andy. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. And thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Barton Goldenberg. Now, that's a nice picture because that was pre-COVID. And you see, post-COVID, I don't shave as often as I used to. So I'm going to apologize <laughs> for not shaving as well as I should have. But that's not a bad picture when I used to shave regularly. Yeah. <laughs> I have been around for about 36 years. And uh, I made a commitment after my graduate studies in London, England, to join a company. I was based in Brussels, Belgium for three years. And at that time, technology was quite new, the concept of personal computers. And I made a commitment from when I left that company to create my own business to really apply technology to business in a way that drives efficiency, productivity, cost savings, et cetera. And that's been my career for 36 years. I don't wanna go into a lot of detail. You can read about me. Um, I, I am a, a regular author, I'm a regular writer, I'm a regular speaker, and I'm delighted to have been honored as many times as I have by the press and by companies, et cetera. And in fact, um, the way we've structured the company is it we call ourselves strategic consultants, so we create and implement customer strategy, and we leverage six different focus areas to help create that customer strategy. Digital transformation, we'll talk a little bit about that today. CRM, we will talk about that today. Digital communities, we'll talk about that today. Virtual augmented reality, we'll talk a little bit about that today. Data analytics, also a little bit today. And customer engagement that Andy's already talked about. And I'm of the belief that these are six areas that can greatly enhance 
both the creation and the implementation of customer strategy. We've been honored to work with some of the world's best customers in, in this country, America, but also in Europe and Asia, Latin America, um, Africa. And so we're deeply honored to have been entrusted by these companies to help them create their customer strategy and implement their customer strategy. And you can learn a lot from the bigger companies. We work with medium-sized companies as well, but you can learn a lot from the big companies for two reasons. They're often willing to take a little more risk because they get somewhat lethargic in their ways. And so they, they need to shake it up a bit. And number two, um, they're just willing on a global scale to try new ideas across multiple regions. And we like to work with global customers. Today's topic, how do you build a digital first company? And I'm gonna focus particularly on the alignment of people, process, technology. So PPT equals people, process, technology in a post-pandemic world. And I'm gonna argue uh, that in fact, building a digital first company, you really do have to first align people, process, technology to make sure that you can really drive that customer loyalty, that customer satisfaction, and ultimately customer advocacy that will drive them back to your company to do business with you. And while I could create a beautiful digital customer strategy or a digital first company, unless I align the people, process, and technology correctly, that strategy would not work. So let's start with the concept of people, process, and technology. And I have to tell you, I wrote about this in 1986. It's been followed uh, you know, by the press and by a lot of people ever since. Uh, but here's what the bottom line is on this picture. 80% of the success in creating and implementing a digital first company will rest upon the people and process components of the equation. And while I could give you the most beautiful technologies, Creatio or others on a silver platter and tell you use these technologies. They perform wonderful tasks when implemented. What we know from years and years of experience is that if the processes that the technology is being used to drive efficiency into, or if the people that are supposed to be using those processes have not been communicated, trained and bought into those processes, adopted them, it doesn't make a difference how good the technology is it will not work. So what I wanna focus on is all three of them because they're all important, but I wanna take them one at a time. And I'm gonna start where we should start and that is on the process front. So let's spend a couple of minutes looking at the importance of process and how to align process within the people process technology. I call it a critical mix in our post pandemic world. And I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do in the, today is I'm gonna give you a couple of different examples of companies one that's been successful, one that has not been successful. All of them are my customers. So I, uh, you, know, you have to be very careful whose names you can use. They're all names you would know very, very well. But unfortunately, I'm not, um, I'm not allowed. I don't think it's appropriate to give the names without seeking permission of the companies. And some of these companies really don't want things mentioned, particularly the companies where things didn't work out well. But anyhow, I'm going to give you the stories. And if you're very clever, you could probably figure out who some of these companies are. So let's look at Process, company on the left, the global agricultural grower. They're number one in the world in terms of creating the plants that grow this particular type of agricultural uh, commodity. It's a hundred million dollar company. It's based in the US, it's global. 40% of its sales are global, 60% still in this country. That will reverse itself shortly as the world is catching on to this delicious agricultural commodity. Um, and consuming it more so than even in North America. So here was the situation. The company is a family business, private company, and they realized what all of us realized during the pandemic, that in order to be truly customer effective, to engage customers, to sustain customers, to drive advocacy in customers, you must have a digital strategy. You must connect with them, stay connected, uh, engage, dialogue in a digital way. And we, th they came to that understanding. I mean, we all use, whether it's Alibaba, if you're in China or other countries, whether it's, it's Amazon or if you're if in America or other countries, we know that digital driven companies can really be very fun to work with. It's easy to work with and there's all kinds of wonderful things. Well, 
the CEO of this particular global agricultural grower came to a similar conclusion that he needed his company to be much more easy to do business with, to be you know, on what we call a net promoter score. So when we asked the question, would you recommend this company to your friend? He wanted to make sure he was at an eight, a nine or a 10. And so he went to work with his executive team and they came up with a group of projects. In fact, there were 17 digital projects that they felt were important as a part of becoming a more digitally focused or digital first company. And that's when we were called in. My buddy is the executive uh, vice president for sales and marketing. I've since obviously got to know the entire company and the executive team quite well. But he called me in because he said, hey, Bart, we have this initiative. We've got an awful lot of projects, but I'm a little afraid that there may be too many and there may be overlap. And I'm not sure that we have a very clear direction on the strategy of how we're going to achieve that customer excellence that we're trying to accomplish. So I came in and, and uh, long story short, we did notice there were a great deal of overlaps between the 17 digital processes that they had undertaken in the areas of production, growing of the plants, uh, selling of the plants, and support of the plants. So there were, there were overlaps and there were also, we found gaps and, 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 and gaps between where one process started and the other one stopped and it was not necessarily flowing well. We found issues with data, so the inability for data to flow across the different processes. And all that led us to do a end-to-end -end process map of the company. Now, I don't know how many of you have undertaken this wonderful exercise, but you have to either have a very big wall that you can write on or a very, very big, long piece of paper that you can write on. But what, in fact, we did is we spent two months and we, we, we wrote down and on, a, on a swim lane process map who are the key players that are involved and what are the core steps that are involved as, the, as we go from deciding which plants to produce, to growing those plants, to selling those plants, working with the lawyers, make sure that all the, um, you know, the, the um, patents were in place and your licenses were in place. You could sell the plants in the country so they couldn't be genetically copied to supporting the, the actual grower in the field when, I don't know, they didn't grow properly, you didn't get the proper yield, et cetera. So the end-to-end -end map, you know, was a, it was a very long process. It involved all aspects of the company. And long story short, we brought, um, we identified in the in the end-to-end -end analysis, end-to-end -end process map, we we actually identified 167 gaps. So a gap is a place where it didn't logically flow. And what that meant is, even if you took technology, the best technology in the world, and put it into place to automate the 17 selected digital pro processes or, or digital projects, it would have been catastrophic. Maybe not catastrophic, but it wouldn't have worked the way they expected it to. And so what we did is we identified these 167 gaps and said, okay, which are worth closing, which are not, can they be easily closed? And long story short, we took 17 digital projects down to nine, nine digital projects that truly were at the core of becoming a digital first company. And we got rid of all the gaps across the nine and that's what's being implemented in this company since like uh, January of this year, or maybe a little bit earlier, November of last year. And we're focused right now on two of the most important of those nine processes. And they're going to be ones that you're comfortable with. One is the key account management process. And this is because I don't want to give away the percentage, but more than 50% of their business is delivered by key accounts globally. And you know, you got to take good care of those accounts. And that's only going to grow in an increasingly global world. And so the decision was let's make sure we have a, a rock, a, a very um a good process that was backed up by technology that all of the key account managers around the world bought into. Let's enhance the organization for key account managers and let's make this a big success. And the second one that we're working on right now with them is on uh, we call a, a, a customer profile process. They've realized, which a lot of companies, unfortunately, uh, either haven't realized or are not practicing, even though they've realized the importance of understanding the needs of your customer, of understanding what is important to your customer, how well you're delivering against those needs or what is important and what needs to be corrected. And I'll come back to this at the very end of my presentation when we talk about the customer profile. But we're working on key account management process, the customer uh, profile process, and I have to tell you, it's really been a wonderful, wonderful journey because what's happening now is information is flowing across these 
in this case, uh, uh, nine projects. And we are on the particular ones to work on key account management customer, um, pro uh, customer profile. We're really getting a, a wonderful participation by all members of the company. Because if you think about it, if an account is global, it's not just global to the sales guy. And if it's a key account, it's not just key to the financial people, but all members, whether you produce the plants or support the plants or ship the plants or you know, uh, sell the plants, you're all involved. And so we have a real global company effort to pull this together. It's a wonderful story of uh, an executive team willing to put together processes that make sense, that help the customer do business with the company, that bring you know, fulfillment to the needs of that customer. It's a willingness of the executive team to take a lot of work and bring it down to a manageable piece of work, and then to close all the gaps and move on to implementing the process. Now, why are they doing this? Because as soon as the process is, flow is done, you start at level one, you bring it down to level five using business process management jargon. Then we're ready to take level five and give it to the programmers of Creatio or of any CRM or whatever that you're using for your technology. And they can literally code using hopefully uh, low code, but they can code the program quickly and we can be up and running in days or weeks or months, not years. That's the success story on the left. Let's go to the story on the right. Now, this is actually not a failure, but it was quite an amazing story. And I can laugh about it now because my buddy, we're, we're, um, we're friends for years and I mentor him and coach him and he's a dear friend. But at the time he was the, he was the uh, strategy officer of this global healthcare insurance company. And it's again, not critical, but they do eye care insurance. Okay, they focus on eye care. And I think they're number one and number two in the world. So I, I was called in by my buddy to a, a meeting and he said, Bart, you know, you're well known for doing good process thinking and being a thought leader. So let me, I wanna share with you our thoughts on how we should drive enhanced customer satisfaction, loyalty and advocacy. And we've you know, really processed out the company. And I, it, was the, it, was in, um, or, it was in Oregon, it was in the state of Oregon in America. And I went to this uh, beautiful uh, company, it was on a beautiful campus with trees and a lake and everything. And it was very light. I remember the, the lots of windows and, and it was a beautiful, beautiful entrance. And my buddy met me at the front desk and he took me downstairs well, it was like going from heaven where there was lights and it was a beautiful campus to hell where there were no windows and it was, you know, dark, you know, do doors and rooms and you had to put the light on to see. And he, he took me into what was called, um, I think they called it the, um, I don't know what they called it, the, uh, the, think, the think tank room or something like that. And long story short, you can't see my office. It was about the size of my office, which is pretty large. And all along every single wall, from the top of the wall to the bottom of the wall was a process map. And he's a wonderful guy and he's a very intelligent fellow. And he, he was waiting for me, his coach, his mentor to say, oh my God, Cyrus, you have done an incredible job process mapping this company. But I didn't say that. I sat back and I said, oh my God, Cyrus, where do you start? If I had to implement what's on these walls right now, I would be dead by the time we got through half of it. And Cyrus, let me ask you, if I could only choose three processes, which would they be? He said, Bart, no, we're not thinking like that. We brought it down to the lowest level. We have every data element worked out. We have every flow of information and, and decision making. I mean, it's, a mirror, it's unbelievable what we've done. Well, I said, just tell me the top three where you're going to start. And that's when he said, that's the problem, Bart. We're not exactly sure where to start. And to me, that was the signal that they had dove down too quickly into the, into the details without thinking about what's important to the company. And in the case of the global agricultural grower that I just talked about, they knew that key account management was at the top of their, their mind for growing the company, and that was their number one process. And so the second company, after the meeting, I remember I met with the vice president of sales. He was no friend of mine or fan of mine after this. His name was Rick. Uh, Rick said, well, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time and money and effort doing these maps, Bart. Um, you know, how quickly can we make it happen? And I said, Rick, I'm, I'm really sorry, but uh, you're not ready to make anything happen. And in fact, you better bring the executive team down there, understand what's truly been done, and give guidance to these wonderful people who have done the process map 
as to what is important to be accomplished in this company. And Rick, if it's sales in your area, you better tell them what kind of sales you're looking at. Is it pipeline management? Is it key account management? Is it you know forecasting? What are you really looking for? And uh, he was quite upset at me. I have to tell you, he was quite upset. But anyhow, this is a tale of two companies. Why is process important? I've already alluded to it. Back in uh, some years ago, I was working with Lucent Technologies, also known as Alcatel today. And that had a component called Bell Labs. And for those that are in the industry of telecommunication, you know Bell Labs was, without a doubt, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, the Nobel Prize winner of all technology in, in, in telecommunications for a period of 20, 20 odd years. They were really, really interesting what they did. And I was called in to automate the CRM and, and we were all set to go. And uh, they had a certain process for forecasting. And the leading vendor, sales, CRM vendor at the time, came into it, the company was in New Jersey, Lucent Technologies, and they promoted their offering. And the forecasting module of this company did not match the forecasting module of how Lucent did its business. But the vendor was a bit arrogant and said, don't worry about it, it'll work for your company. And long story short, we, uh, the company was overwhelmed by the, you know, the technology. They put it in and about less than three months later, they stopped using the technology because the technology did not mimic the process of the company and the technology did not take into account reconfiguration, hopefully again, using low code to reconfigure the software in a way that would work for the way the company did business. And the reason process is so important is, and I've said it already, if you don't have a, a good process and you apply great technology to it, what great technology does make a bad process worse, quicker, and there's nothing more silly to do than make a bad process make, you know, happen worse and quicker. Thus, the reason process is so important and accounts for about 30% of the overall success of creating and implementing a successful digital first company. Let's move Pardon on. If I may, are there are a couple... There are a couple of questions that came in during that, uh, first of all, wonderful set of examples there. Um, one of them spoke to, I guess, your, your interaction with, uh, with Rick. It says, uh, the question is, <clears throat> at their company, people perceive all new apps and processes as the enemy. Uh, and how can, uh, how can this individual motivate or make, uh, make the people you make that perspective change? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, uh, every company uh, struggles with this. So I don't have an answer, but I have insight from 36 years of working with a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. So there's different types of, of so, so the, the short answer to that is, um, unless they feel there's something in it for them, we call that the with them, what's in it for me, mm -hmm. unless every executive feels, or sales manager, or marketing manager, or you know, director, or vice president, unless they feel that the initiative, technical initiative, process initiative is, helping them in what they need, they're not going to support it. And I don't blame them not for supporting it. So your job, if you will, is to put together a convincing argument to any and all people that are involved to show them that what's in it for them is in their best interest to uh, you know, implement uh, this particular initiative. But let me, let me give the longer answer to that. There are many different individuals you're going to face. Some I'd like to call forward thinking individuals. These are people that are reading the latest and greatest, that when they play golf with their buddies, you know, their CEOs, they're not just talking about golf. They're talking about some of the latest things that are being used in management practice and theory. And these are people that are always trying to stay ahead of the curve. People are saying, no, I don't, you know, status quo is not good. Let's shake it up and make it better. Those people are a pleasure to work with, and they're much easier to convince because you're going to talk about gaps inside the processes, inefficiencies. You know, I remember in the, in the case of the agricultural grower, one customer, um, they, they screwed up because of a, a flaw in the process. It cost the company uh, a lot of money. And the, and, the, and the executive was really sensitive to that. So, you know, we, we kind of presented it as a way to move forward with a better customer relationship. We will never lose money with the customer again by having to give them their plants back and, and so forth. So there's the forward thinking individual. And there's another one that we're just going to call, I'd like to call somebody that perceives a need, but isn't convinced. I know this isn't right, but, you know, I mean, is it worth the trouble? And, you know, I'm going to retire in two years and I don't know if it's really worth it. And, uh, you know, maybe the next guy will do it and we'll kick the can down the road. And there's that type of person. And then there's the person that kind of, kind of puts their feet down and says, you know, I'm vice president of this company in sales and I know how to do sales and we've been doing great sales. There's nothing wrong with my sales and you go somewhere else and talk your, uh, your gibberish. Uh, I don't have the time for it. And there's another person that is just fearful. 
because they've been hurt. The competition has cut their legs off by being better, quicker, faster, more effective than they have. And now they're really scared. And they're, they're going to listen to you because they, they know they didn't get it right. So you got to kind of understand who are you dealing with. Now, let me tell you one story. It deals with Nike. Here I can mention names because of certain reasons. So Nike is a you know, global food and, and apparel manufacturer. And Phil Knight was the founder and, and uh, CEO and, and, and chairman for many, many years. He's since retired and done brilliant work in philanthropy. But I was in uh, the, the, the bar at the, at, in Beaverton, Oregon, which is Nike headquarters, a gorgeous headquarters. And I was in the bar. It's an old wooden bar, kind of like a British pub. And we were having a couple of beers. I, I believe we could have beers in those days. And um, we we're having lunch. And we had to deliver to Phil Knight the results of a large uh, survey that was done by a third party asking retailers how easy it was to do business with Nike, how pleasurable it was to do business with Nike, you know, would you, do, would you recommend Nike to your friend, et cetera, et cetera. And we had terrible results. Now, the, at that time, Nike had hit a glass ceiling. A glass ceiling is where you, they couldn't break through $13 billion in sales. And so what happened was we, 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 we knew they hit the glass ceiling. We used that to say, you know, Phil, uh, we've hit a glass ceiling. And the results have come in and they don't look good. We were 17 out of 18 for the global apparel and foot manufacturing companies. People were really unhappy. Nike was arrogant. They deliver the tops and not the bottoms. They deliver size five, but not a six. And, you know, they, Nike just felt yeah, they were the best so they could do what they wanted. And I'll never forget. I'll never forget. Phil Knight slams his hand down on the desk of the, uh, on the, of the pub, the table. And he says, no customer is going to tell me how to do business at Nike. <laughs> Whoa, he said, man, do we have a problem. Now, Phil came around eventually, but his first reaction was, I started this company out of the backseat of my car. I've grown it. I, and if you haven't read his book, Shoe Dog, what a wonderful book to understand you know, his story. I know this company well. I don't need people to tell me how to run the company. Thank you very much. So to answer the question, you've got to figure out the what's in it for them. And it's not that hard to do whether it's cost savings, whether it's overcoming fear, whether it's driving efficiency into the company, whether it's taking, a, you know, being ahead of the competition because you're doing something better, whether it's customer advocacy, there's all kinds of reasons that you can build in your business justification and every digital strategy that I create with my customer strategy digital, we make sure that the value proposition is crystal clear to every executive and whether they are forward thinking or fearful or perceived needs, or you know, uh, just you know, digging their heels in, you've got to find that what's in it for them. I hope that answered the question, Andy. Oh, I'm sure it did. I'll just ask one more. Hopefully this will be a quick, because I don't want to derail too much of your, your amazing stories that everybody's really interested in. But um, when you were talking through all the process flows and, and the, the complexity there, a question came in about what are the main instruments on how to arrange internal and external processes? And it might be an interesting point for a lot of folks in the audience. Yeah, I wish I had the time. We don't, and I'm happy to, for those okay. that are interested, I'm happy to follow. But I'd like to show you the swim lane of, of the company we did the end end. I, I can't show it on a screen, but I can show piece of it on a screen. But here's the scoop. You've got to look at, uh, on the left-hand side, are the players. So there's the customer, right? That's very important. And then you've got the different departments inside the company. In fact, we even started with prospect, customer. Then we have, you know, sales, marketing, customer service, production, legal, um, shipping, and uh, I don't know, executive, there's a whole bunch of them on the left. And by the way, that's because it's such a long drawing, that's repeated every foot or so, so you can remember who you're talking about. <laughs> on the top of it are the stages of this company's end-to-end -end process. So in this case, the company actually creates the genomics for the best possible variety of this particular agricultural commodity. That's a process. And then once they've done that, they give it to the, and they, they, there's a, you know, they interact with, the, with the, the customer to see if it's the type of fruit that would be the like. They interact with the production people that actually grow it. They take the, 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 the little um, seed, if you want to call it that, it's a slightly, it's a, it cuts them, and they put it into a putt, and they grow into a, a, a one-inch putt, and eventually into a larger putt, and that's what gets sold to the farmers in the field. So there's the production component. There's the sales component. Pre-sales, sales, then there's the support component. They call it grower support because they support the growers. And inside the sales, there was the legal department that had to sign off. And there was the shipping that had to get the product ready. And there was all kinds of stuff. And so we just kind of used the left-hand side, the players, 
the top hand side, the process flow. We actually worked with customers to make sure the process worked in a way that felt comfortable to them. That's a big step. And then we had many, many meetings where we brought in various subject matter experts, depending upon what stage of the end end process we were in to validate uh, that the process was right. And then very importantly, um, using the Visio charts, we did the uh, integration between processes and the handoffs between processes. So to answer your question, Andy, um, you got to get, I, I believe you have to get the customer involved. Some companies don't like to, but I believe you do. Um, but you have to have them at least in, in thought, in mind. You have to, I think, at least sanity check what you're doing with them if they're not involved in it. And then you move literally from the left to the right, left, you know, in this case, I create a, a plant, right? I have a set, of, by the way, the last step was post customer support. Because if you think about it, you want to acquire customers, you want to retain customers, and you want to grow customers. That's your job. And so the final right-hand side was grow customers. How do we grow customers post-sales? And so it was, a, it was a process map that went piece by piece, but it had all these wonderful handoffs um, between the different pieces of it. I, I hope I've answered your question, Andy. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, um, at this rate, we could have another beautiful discussion for a long time, but I think I should go back to the yes. second component of the people process technology and how to align that in a post pandemic. And here I want to talk about the people component. And I, uh, you know, I, I have that at 50%. And, and you might argue, oh my goodness, Bart, you're crazy. Technology is really what makes it or process what makes it. I don't agree. I've seen time and time again, people screw up the best process because they didn't adopt it or they didn't buy into it or all the reasons that you said, you know, they didn't chart it outright. Or I've seen, you know, a, a, a great digital first company screw up because they failed to really understand that people need to use the technology. And I always joke uh, with my wife or my family, I didn't get up this morning to come into my office to use Zoom to make a presentation. I woke up this morning to get a hug, to have a good bowl of cereal, to enjoy my bike ride to Georgetown and to, and to live life. So nobody is sitting there waiting to use technology, believe me. So if you're going to use it, you better make sure that the people have bought into it, which brings me to the whole process, a good story and a not so good story. So again, I, I don't want to use names here. It's not important. On the left-hand side is, a, is a, uh, one of the top three global oil and gas corporations in the world. And uh, about, uh, about 12 years ago, I was called into a meeting in uh, Houston, Texas, and uh, at that time, they said, we need to come up with a digital strategy for the company. And that was really forward thinking, I have to tell you. 12 years ago, that was very forward thinking. Here was the dilemma they had. They made, uh, in this case, uh, uh, gasoline for your cars, uh, you know, and they also made lubrication, lubrication for you know, machines and other things like that. I was working with the lubrication side of the business at the time. And the thinking was, we, we make the lubricants and we sell it to a distributor. More than 80% of their business went through distributors. And the distributors bought in large quantity and broke it up in a smaller quantity, or they bought lots of small quantity and, and held it in a warehouse. And then the, the retailer, whether it was an automotive, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, a dealer, or whether it was a manufacturer of, I don't know, uh, products that had machinery, they would come to the distributor and buy their products. The problem was this company did not have a view of the end customer. They didn't know their customer because there was a distributor in the way. And it's not that we don't like distributors. They played a very important role. But if the distributor is out of touch with the customer and the distributor is sharing the knowledge of the customer with the company, then the company is, is going to be in trouble because they have a misunderstanding of what's going on between company and customer. So the question was, how, when we build our digital strategy, can we make sure we have direct access to the customers? And long story short, they built something. I, it's not important, the name. It's, um, it's a digital customer community. It's actually a digital hotel. And for those of you that uh, would like, uh, I did another session for Create Show on the digital hotel. You can go back and look at the archives. I'm sure they have it somewhere else. But, but short, short story, on the bottom floor, they have uh, 3,700 lubrication engineers that come to this digital community. It's a private community, so you're invited. You have to make sure that you work for a company and not a competitor. You're not you know, whatever, you have to make sure that we are, you know, you're integratable. And there are rules, you can't talk about price, you can't use profanity. So it's a very, you know, honorable, uh, professional community. It's actually, uh, we built it and we monitor it. So we know very well what goes on in community. And people come on the ground floor of the hotel, you can 
share stories like videos, you can take polls and surveys, you can join a forum, you can give your opinion, you can ask the expert a question, and you start to create a dialogue, let's just call it peer-to-peer -peer exchange. On the second and third floor of this digital hotel, they have the conference rooms. They have a conference room for technology, they have one for distributors only, one for employees only, they have one for training, and they have one for um, I, uh, I don't remember, there's a couple more. And those are open forums that you get invited to and you participate digitally. And top of the, uh, the conference rooms are the individual company. We call them the digital customer rooms. And that's where you meet one-on-one -on -one with your customer to create your sales plan, to monitor it, to meet with executives, to meet with third-party experts. And it's a private room where you, can, you get invited by your sales representative or it might be the executive and you have time to digitally connect. Throughout the hotel are the Zoom buttons, so you can join face-to-face -face if that's important. And in this particular case, it's not important for many. You've got the augmented reality and virtual reality buttons that will bring you into the fields or into the factories so you can see the products in action. Now, what was important about this is that was a very forward-thinking concept 12 years ago. And the, the buddy who was a Scotsman, he was a very senior executive at this company, and he was a, uh, he was his of uh, football fan, a uh, soccer fan, as we call it in this country. And uh, he was an Arsenal fan from, from Britain. Now, uh, you know, we have to comment that the Brits don't know how to behave with football, but anyhow, it was a good team, Arsenal. And he said, Bart, I belong to the Arsenal football club fan, and I love to go to it. Why can't we do the same thing with our company? So I said to him, Ian, we can. And we created this 13 years ago. Now, let me tell you what Ian did. Ian pushed all the bureaucratic roadblocks out of the way each step we tried to move this initiative forward and Ian told all of the important people we've got to do it and here's the reason why so he was my executive sponsor he was the piston if you will that drove uh, executive sponsorship ever since and and it's been up 13 years I will tell you it's one of the few programs and you know what happened in the oil industry last year it took a bath it got really slaughtered in 1920 it was one of the few marketing and sales programs that did not get cut I mean, it got cut back, but it did not get cut completely because of the you know, severe drop in price and, and, uh, of oil for both COVID and, and, and lots of other reasons. And I, I will tell you that this, this platform, this digital custom community, um, has been bought into by every single one of the executives ever since. Uh, they know it's the number one lead nurturing platform for the company. They can bring in a new prospect. They know the digital... Uh, journeys of, of the existing members, distributors, and customers that are in the community. They have tracked the digital uh, you know, uh, journey. When a new prospect comes in, they help the prospect look at the key points on the journey that make them the best customer. And they find that the leads join the company much quicker. They move down the sales funnel much more quickly and they're happier customers. So there's just the point where we had tremendous support. We had great buy-in. And we know that it's a, in the community, by the way, pays for itself because of the new business that's generated by people buying more product. The executives know the story. They support it. People have bought into it. They love it. They share videos, internal, external. They make time to be a part of the community. If you're a sales guy, it rocks. And that's what's important. Company on the right. A wonderful company. Uh, without a doubt, again, in the top three fitness program companies, you've danced to their music. You've gone to their gyms, I promise you. But here was the problem. They were very forward thinking. They wanted to be closer to the customer. They actually had a digital customer community that monitored. They had, you know, think about who are in a fitness program. You have the teachers, you have the customers, you and me, and then you have the company. And the teachers were the ones that, you know, taught you how to do certain moves or dances or whatever you were doing. And also chose the music, et cetera, et cetera. The problem was the executives were growing this company was growing like a rocket ship like like uh like um jeff bezos today like a rocket ship it's about to take off and the executives felt that crm and the customer uh, strategy and 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 uh, the whole digital community very very important very very important and they told us very very important and we proceeded to do the audit and make recommendations and they moved on to the next project the executive team and when we came back to make the presentation, they were too busy to participate. They said, it's a great project, great project, you should do it. But we had no support. And the moment we asked for money, they said, what? Why would you want all that kind of money? Well, that's what we agreed to at the beginning. Well, but we haven't been involved. Well, I know, but yet we've invited you, but you haven't been there. Well, I mean, I, well, let's just move on. I guess this is the right time for that project. Project was killed. 
Now think about that. That all of that could have been avoided had we had executive insight and so forth. Three components to the people side. It's communication that can make any regularly. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? When are we doing it? Who's involved? You know, in, in the case of the agricultural company, we've built in digital triggers inside the CRM so that when anything happens, the right people get communicated to as to what happened. So it's built right in. It happens automatically. The second component of good people is training. We are spending enormous amount of time to train people on how to use the tool effectively and how to use the process effectively. And the right way to do training is you put the process map up, you make sure everybody knows the process, and then you show how the technology supports the map. That's the right way to do training. And then the third piece is we support, you know, you give tremendous support to the, the, to the initiative with the understanding. Why is in life, things come up, things go down, the moods, the emotions, and you got to continually support and show them what's in it for me. That's the people side. Let's continue on the technology side. Now, a lot of you are going to say, oh my goodness, Bart, how can technology be only 20%? And the answer is, I don't know where else to take it from. People I know is not less than 50, and I know process is not less than 30, and I got to add up to 100. Now, let's be very clear. I'm not saying technology is unimportant. It's not. I'm not saying technology is inexpensive. It's not. I'm not saying that a bad implementation of technology doesn't screw everything up. It does. But what I'm saying is in the big picture, as you create a digital first company, the technology will account for 20% of the success of the overall digital first initiative. So let me make a couple of points on this. I also should mention, you know, we're, this is being sponsored by Creatio. It's a wonderful company. I, I don't say that. They don't pay me for this. Uh, you know, I just happen to like working with them because they're a fun company and got a fun executive team and, and their customers are happy. And so I, I like to work with this type of a company. You know, Creatio works. The technology works. By the way, so does everybody else's technology. All their competitors' technology works. So it's not about the technology. It's about the ability for the company to work with you on process and people to make sure you're applying a successful program. To me, that's what's important. So let's go to the left and the right. We'll make these short. So the global electric car manufacturer, this one I think is, I better not mention that one. You'll know it. It's uh, again, one of the top electronic car manufacturers, very few in the world. Here's what, um, here's what came out as a press release just last week. In the competitive car industry, we'll call it company X, stands on top. The company has the highest customer satisfaction rating of any car manufacturer. Company X customers tend to be incredibly loyal, and 91% of the customers plan to buy or lease another Company X car. Now, let me tell you something. Every car company would like that to be their company. Unfortunately, it's not. And what is it that this company's done well? Well, you know, as we move from a kind of a more mechanical world to a more electric world, a whole bunch of parts, we got rid of the parts, the car breaks down less often. And now we're down to really a battery platform, some mechanical wheels, you know, steering, braking and so forth, but an awful lot of software to drive the vast majority of everything else. That's the technology component. The technology component to know that you live in this part of the world where it rains more than that part of the world and to adjust the speed of your windshield wipers accordingly. The company that knows that you drive long-term versus short-term and recommends a certain type of oil versus a, a different type of oil. The company that knows that you, know, you drive at a particular time of the day and you know, recommends certain changes to how the car is, 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 is used on a, on a surface, whether it's a rough surface or a, or a light surface in, in what times of days. And it knows all about you because when you go to uh, fill up you know, using electrical, it knows when you last filled up with electricity, how many miles you drove, what was the weather conditions, and it's constantly making changes to that software, working with you as the customer to make it enjoyable, such that 91% of you are going to buy the next car. That's the success story. Using technology, taking into account that incredibly important customer interface, customer exchange, customer interaction, customer approval, customer, customer, customer. The company on the right, unfortunately, didn't really follow um, the rules. This is a wonderful company, by the way. And I, 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 had an, I initially had a global financial services company, but I changed it this morning to the oil field service just because they're, they're both great stories, but I, I think this is the better story. So this is a company that is, it's number one in its industry. It's, it's without a doubt the best 
oil field survey company in the world. It's, it's wonderful in terms of engineering and technology. It, it's really, really good. But they've gotten a little bit arrogant because they're so good, they think they can tell the oil industry how to do business. And you can't. And there's competitors that have come about. And the competitors have offered digital products. And this company said, no, you buy from our salespeople. And the customers started to take more and more business with their competitors. And finally, the company said, oh, they're so painful, these small companies. We'll just bring our own e-commerce platform onto the market and we'll sell our drill bits and our valve stems and our O-rings and all the stuff that's required when you do drilling. And they created a beautiful platform and they spent a lot of money. They never, never involved the customer because the company they hired told them, we've been doing this for years. We know what we're talking about. And they launched it with fanfare and the executive team was there and they signed the multi-million dollar check and it lasted about nine months and sales started to do this straight down because it wasn't easy to buy something and it wasn't apparent and to return it wasn't easy and to get the attention of support wasn't easy. And they could have corrected it and they did along the way, but they had lost the customer uh, loyalty. And so the customer continued to buy from the competition. It's not that the technology was bad. I'm sure it was very good. It's just that they didn't implement it with excellence. They failed to integrate the data, the full data about the customer, the profile with the e-commerce site. So they would ask questions about the customer they knew the answers to, but because they hadn't integrated, they didn't, you know, it wasn't apparent. And it was done in, you know, certainly not low code, so it couldn't be done on the fly easily, so they couldn't make changes easily. Difference between the car, electric car manufacturer working with their customers to make sure the technology fit and felt right. Question with the global oil failed services that, you know, thought that they knew how to build an e-commerce site better than their customers. Okay, so let's continue. On the technology side, I'm not going to go into any of these. But I do want to mention, and I already alluded to this, technology is important. It's critical. So here's the six I have my eye on as we move forward. I've already talked about the digital communities, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Uh, if you're not actively involved as you build your digital first company, that uh, it's a must. It's, you know, you know AI through, you know, lots and lots of different ways, whether it is visual through health applications or location identity whether it's facial and, sp and, and, uh, and speech recognition through Ceres or Cortana, whether it's through language translation, the wonderful Google uh, uh, translator or translate, whether it's autonomous vehicles, whether it's through climate control or all the business applications like lead scoring and chatbots and sales forecasting. There's all kinds of wonderful ways AI has infiltrated and you have to learn it and it has to be a part because what it does is it allows you to know what's next best for your customer to please them and know what to offer when and who to offer what to. And so that's critical. Virtual reality and augmented reality is the most disruptive technology over the next decade. You know it and many of us know it because either yourself or your kids are sitting like a you know, bunch of funny people you know, with their, their goggles on, their Oculus 2 or whatever, and their hands over a couple of those machines. And I do it myself and it's wonderful fun. But that's now into the into the marketplace, so into the uh, private uh, business world. So whether it's remote access, being able to do, uh, you know, putting in a machine into a into a, um, a manufacturing floor uh, digitally through augmented reality, or going to IKEA and fixing up your living room with furniture to see how it looks through IKEA, or whether it is visiting the vineyards or the agricultural fields of my my uh, agricultural company, or whether it is training uh, one thousand two hundred um, Mercedes-Benz technicians on how to do engine better, quicker, more efficiently. It's penetrated the market. You've got to be looking into AR, VR, and all of these. We help our clients create strategies and know what, you know, what is the state of the art. Information of um, um, IoT, um, Internet of Things, is critically important. Um, again, largely in manufacturing, but also elsewhere. Um, on the retail side, um, a, a company, um, uh, what's the name of it? Um, it'll come to me one second. Um, uh, what's her name? Rebecca Minkoff in this country. It's a, it's a fashion house. So all products in the Rebecca Minkoff store are RIDF uh, tagged so that we know where the, the garments are. You go into the room. It's a, called a smart mirror. You can try on clothes. Say, I don't like the way that fits. You can push a button and say, give me the next size. Let me see what it looks like. You can click a button and say, give me this garment. I want to try it on. 
uh, even if somebody took the garment to the next department and forgot to bring it back, we know where it is because it's our idea for our uh, tagged. Our, uh, and, uh, and so they bring it to the dressing room. That's on the IoT side for retail. On the uh, B2B side, it's throughout all the inventories. Look at what Amazon has done for with using Internet of Things for um, pallets and palletizing and picking and sorting and knowing when. I mean, isn't it amazing? You order your product in the morning and it's delivered in the afternoon. I mean, wow, that's amazing. And that's all part of IoT. 5G is critically important. I think that's important now, particularly as we move into um, you know, kind of 2023, 24, 25, forecasts about half of the global population will use 5G by 2024. It's a game changer when it is fully available. Um, it'll have its biggest impact, I think, on manufacturing smart cities, autonomous vehicles. But it is you get a faster connection, extreme bandwidth density, ultra low latency, and you get high levels of security that you don't get in other networks. I'm saying all these because as you build a digital first, you do have to look at these technologies. 20% of the success though. Now, the one I wanna just focus on for a minute in honor of the people that asked me to come aboard is to, um, to look at low code. But before I do that, I wanna do a quick poll. We're gonna have a little bit of fun. See if I can do this correctly. I believe I should be able to. Uh, let's go to... And Barton, while you do that, we've had an amazing set of your stories. I just want to give you a heads up that we, we only have about five minutes or so uh, remaining, or, or seven minutes uh, We're not doing a poll. for all of your content. <laughs> We're not doing a poll. Okay. Let's go on, let's, let's go on to, uh, what have I done here? Let's go on to, um, come back up, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish. Amazing up. content. Okay. So let's go back to the presentation. Let's close that. Um, let me just talk about low code and why what okay. our friends at Creatio are doing is so important. And again, I this is not a commercial. I don't get paid for them, you know. But but here's the bottom line, and it goes back on some some, some things that I've talked about. You know, requirements for building a successful digital first company is sound business processes. That's the thirty percent. Whether it's customer profile, I've alluded to journey mapping, closed loop marketing, digital tracking, is lots of them. But you have to have those processes. And then you have to have easy to build apps and programs that not just one department, one choke point is able to do, but multiple people can get involved in and make it you know, easy to do with your customer's input and collaboration. But what's the problem in companies? We've already talked about broken business processes, customer facing internal either. We've talked about a disconnect between what the business guys want and what the IT department thinks that should be done and the tension and friction that causes, and the delays in projects. We've talked about disjointed technologies where you know, my CRM doesn't integrate with my e-commerce or my you know, digital community doesn't integrate with my whatever. And we also have a very big challenge in the industry right now with a deficit of skill sets for people that can do um, good app development or and, and other such technologies. And this is where low code plays an incredibly important role. Because what happens in low code is technology extends beyond the IT department. And what happens is you bring together, as we did in the agricultural uh, uh, company, uh, people that build the, the, the manufacture the, the plants, we brought the technologies, the process, the teams are all connected and in the room as we create processes and technologies that will work. And then the processes get programmed easy because low code technology allows you to process in literally minutes um, or, or, or hours, but definitely not days, weeks, or months, or certainly not weeks and months, maybe minutes, hours, and days, but not weeks and months. And then the app gets rolled out accordingly. Now, you could argue, and I've heard people say, you know, low code is an additional workload. We, have to, we, we must learn it. We waste a lot of time before we can use it. Isn't there an easy way not to have to use low code? And the answer is no. Um, low code is really very important. And it's important because choosing the right platform with a comprehensive uh, support package is gonna be critical to the type of company you wanna do business with on the low code platform. I've noticed, and I find this quite amusing. I think Creatio really started low code, I could be wrong, but they're pretty much you know, at the foundation. And now look at all the companies that are talking about low code and why their low code is better than everybody else's low code. But here's the bottom line. Creatio built low code from the ground up. It's always been low code. They've integrated all this sales, marketing, customer service, all these other companies talking about low code, it's for part of their software, not for the whole software. And so, you know, let's just, let's cut all the, the promises and let's talk about reality. 
and and so what I really want to say is um, with working with the right partner, whether it's Cree Show or whoever you fancy, with the right platform, you really aren't adding work to your load. You're tweaking and doing things that are easy and intuitive. You're you know dividing tasks between the programmers, the apps developers, and the marketing or whatever the sales support, and you get the job done by working together. But I'd be more focused on the provider of the platform and their ability to support it in a company like Creatio. Let me bring it to um, a couple of conclusions. So how do you build a digital first company? Uh, I'm going to answer each of these questions one at a time. And, and, and how important are these changing habits? And, and what is this critical mix? So how do you build a digital company? You know, this sounds pretty silly, doesn't it? But the same way you would eat an elephant, you build it in pieces. And you do have to have a thought through strategy. We use a very structured, we call it the top down, bottom up methodology. It's been, we've used it for all 36 years. It's structured that forces the top to think down in terms of what vision you have and how that's going to work from the bottom up. And it forces the people on the bottom to, you know, want to take care of the customer to make sure you think up and make sure you, you accomplish the goals of the company. And so you build it in pieces. I think that we've had enough success stories and enough failures in digital transformation over the last three years, and particularly the last year and a half, that has said to us, you got to have a strategy and you got to bite it off in small pieces, just the way you bite uh, an elephant, just the way you eat an elephant. I'd go a step further though. When building a digital first company, my oh my, customer knowledge and customer engagement are at the core of building that company post COVID-19. And I have to tell you how many companies I go into that tell us, you know, we really know our customer well, they love us to death. And I begin to do some stats and search around and do surveys and meet with customers. And I'm sorry to have to inform the executive, just like I had to inform Phil Knight, uh, sir, ma'am, it's just not true. And it's a devastating realization, mm -hmm. but if you're trying to build a digital first company, um, even one piece at a time, and you're not integrating and involving customer knowledge and customer engagement, I don't think you're going to succeed. Number two, at the core of a customer engagement or a customer knowledge is the customer profile. Think of it as a flower. In French, we call it a marguerite or a daisy in English. It has uh, the customer in the center of the profile, in the center of the flower, and it has petals of information that you want to know about that customer on the outside of the flower. And the one in highlighted digital insights and marketing, that's the new petal in the flower. Now, just like any horticulturalist, petals eventually get old. You have to pull them out. The information gets old, stale, not relevant. You got to get rid of it and let a new petal grow inside your flower. And that's what it requires for a good customer profile. Customer profile is not a technology, it's a process. How do we add data? How do we get rid of data? Who's allowed to override data? What is the customer role, et cetera? How do we review it? It's a big process. So just to kind of go back and finish this one, we started by saying you create it one piece at a time by making sure you have customer knowledge and you're engaging the customer. And at the core of that is the profile. Second question, how easy is change? And we've already talked about it. This is from Gartner. They're considered by many, a, you know, a really leading authority as well. COVID-19 caused seven out of 10 board of directors to accelerate their digital business. But accelerating digital requires a change in work habits. And the reality is people don't change their habits overnight. I give you one test. Go home tonight to whomever you sleep with and say, tonight's a special night. Tonight, we're changing sides of the bed. I usually sleep on the left. Tonight, I'm sleeping on the right. And what you're going to find is your partner is going to say, no, I'm actually quite comfortable on the right. You're going to say, no, I really want to try this. And they're going to dig their heels and say, no, my table's over there, my book, my light, you know, all my stuff's there. I, I really don't want to change. Now think about it. If you had trouble just switching sides of the bed with your partner, can you imagine how challenging it is to build a digital first company with customers? Which is why, in fact, Gartner went a step further. And what they said, what they said they're not saying cooperatively. What they said was, acceleration is not just a technology problem. It requires a deliberate effort to rethink the ways in which work is performed, processes are undertaken, and decisions are made, enabling more agile and better adaption to the emerging work culture. And that leads me to my final point. Culture. People, process, technology. 80% about people and processes 
20% about technology. Thank you, Andy. Oh, well, thank you so much. I you know the audience really appreciate that. I know there are some additional uh, questions from the audience, but I think unfortunately we, we won't have uh, time. We want to respect everybody's calendar. So we may have to send those in, uh, in follow-up. Andy, you send uh, me those I, questions. You send me the questions. My promise to everybody is I'll answer those questions. Oh, wonderful. Well, the, the examples and stories that you gave were, were really amazing. So really appreciate, as always, your participation. I'm putting up on the screen for our audience uh, before people have to depart. Uh, just a few QR codes and information. If you'd like to find additional information about today's topic or about some of the technology that Barton uh, mentioned, certainly we have a, a 14 day free trial available of our latest release. You can check that out here. And two other quick announcements. You can certainly subscribe to our YouTube channel to find, you know, Barton has presented at other uh, sessions with us as well as another, other sets of luminaries who have uh, joined us for these sessions. So if you enjoyed today's, we, uh, we're certain you'll find more there. And uh, lastly, we would welcome all of you to, in, to join our no-code hackathon. Uh, so when we talk about this being in the hands of, of business users, business analysts, uh, line of business professionals, not just IT, uh, we mean that and we'd love for you to come and join us on that. So with that, let me thank you all again for spending the hour with us. Barton, of course, our sincere thank you to you. We will definitely get you those questions and uh, get follow-ups out to everyone as, uh, as part of the deliverable. So thank you all for joining today. Have a wonderful rest of your day.